From her days on Midday with Ray Martin, to being one of the presenters on Coast to Coast, to instructing us all how to do the time warp in the Rocky Horror Show, all showing off her singing chops dressed as an octopus, to becoming the most recognisable face and name in all of Australian media, to now being the author of over 25 books, with the most recent literary achievement, My Daughter's Wedding, currently available. Please welcome a guest I'm exceptionally excited and very, very nervous to have, Gretel Colleen. Hello. Yay, thank you. Now let me ask you a question. Why are you so nervous? I think because you're uh, you're so incredibly accomplished. Um, you, you know, you're a, a writer. You've um, worked on big TV shows. You uh, are an author. You're a commentator. You're fiercely intelligent. Uh, and I guess as an interviewer, like trying to match that intellect is really hard. And there's certainly going to be no chance yes. of me pulling the wool over your eyes. You're very, so it's like you're scared I'm going to bite you, but I will not. <laughs> I will be very, very, you know, I appreciate this chat. So I, I'll be like a kitten in your hands. <laughs> Do you find that people generally get pretty nervous when they're chatting to you? Mm, what can I say? Well, I wouldn't know, really. Um it's funny. It goes through waves because I haven't been super famous, you know, for years. So people recognize me, different kinds of people recognize me from different places. Sometimes heterosexual men go a bit weird because um, <laughs> they've got to, you know, they've got to be the biggest bull in the paddock kind of thing yeah. and they can get a bit competitive, I guess. I don't know. Um, sometimes they show off quite a bit, but maybe that's what they normally do. I don't know. And, um, like, I, I went into, because uh, I'm doing an artwork at the moment and I needed something from an op shop, and I went in today and uh, and the woman behind the counter, this is a, you know, a charity op shop, she was just <laughs> screaming and carrying on. Anyway, so he had a photo. I mean, it's fun that you can make someone's day like that, but it reminded me of what it used to be like to have absolutely no privacy. That yeah. that can be very invasive. So when I see people who are still in the peak of their fame or have had it for all those decades, I don't envy that at all. I, I like I like anonymity to the degree that I do have and it's a bit like living in a, a village you know where people know you but they're not chasing you because that's the horrible part of it so it's a bit like a sweet for you you can't have it all the time but occasionally someone will recognize you and ask for a photo and you go oh that's a bit nice I don't want this every day but for now this is perfect yeah <laughs> yeah well I, I, there's a lot of fondness you know there's a lot of affection for in particular you know and I won't bang on about Big Brother because I don't want to oh, because no. it just it was <laughs> many years and years and years ago. But it, it holds that's the first series that we did, you know, the first years yep. and years. People have such a fond place for that in their hearts. And I actually think a lot of it is also nostalgia for a simpler time in life. So, yep. just so the, that's uh, what I mean networks about the village to choose feeling. from. Everyone knew the same shows. Everyone was on the same Thing. It was a magical time. Yeah, very, uh, it, it, very different to now, but it just, it just felt more cuddly. I guess <laughs> we're all in the ride together. Yeah. Now, is it true that your um, career started by accident by you reading one of your poems out loud? Yeah, yeah, it's true. I um, I was studying at the time. I was doing communications. This is way before it was fashionable. There was only one place that did it. <laughs> like, I don't even know how I heard about it. Um, it was a great course to do and they had a poetry night and I had thought I'd written a very serious poem yeah. and people started laughing and <laughs> it's very um, it's, a, it's very delicious, that feeling of making people laugh. It was a bit shocking but yeah. it was delicious um, and I didn't know that I could do that, make people laugh. So that's where it started. But I never felt, I, I, I didn't feel comfortable as a performer. I was quite a shy person in that sense, able to be, uh, to talk confidently about politics or perspectives, but not being an artist is a much more vulnerable position, as whether it's yeah. as a 
comic or musician, painter, whatever it is, it, it's much more vulnerable because it's revealing part of yourself. So I didn't know that's what I was doing that night. I thought I was just <laughs> telling a story and a poem. Yeah. So were you conflicted afterwards? Like um, you thought you were telling a serious poem and then people were laughing and you said you found that quite nice, but did that shock you more or got you more excited and intrigued to go further with it? Oh, it's a funny thing. I just felt like this was my path uh, to be to be detouring off the main road of yeah. main road being go to university and, and have a more traditional job. But I, it just wasn't me. Uh, and so I was drawn with, there was really like there was a rope in my heart pulling me in a direction that I kind of didn't want to go. Uh, I didn't go want to go to because I just had, didn't know if I had any talent or, and, but I just knew the other way wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, so it, the, the angels were guiding me one way, but I was like, Oh, couldn't we just go over that way? <laughs> that looks nice. And no, um, because I think a lot of us yearn for security yeah. in some way. And when you work in the arts, the security you have is a, a small band of trusty friends Yeah, and your belief in yourself. Well, there aren't many performers or anyone in the world who has a great belief in themselves because um, we're human, so we're going to spot our flaws and performers in particular, artists in particular, and uh, and. I say trusty friends because in any industry, success will attract people as well uh, who you think are your friends and then they'll disappear as soon as you're not successful um, or as soon as your successful wave has passed for that moment. So um, it it would have been, life wouldn't have been more interesting. Um, I wouldn't know such fabulous people if I'd gone down a straighter path and I actually don't think I could have. Yeah. but I think many of us wish that we did have that that DNA to some degree so that we weren't always – we have to try very hard in the arts all the time. Yeah, Everything we do battle. gets marked. And, yeah, it's, it's like an exam all the time or, or a popularity contest or something. So we've really got to develop a great solid attitude towards that so you're not – excessively vulnerable to you know, to the the different temperatures of, of response that you are inevitably going to get in a career. So there we go. Yes, I would love a more traditional life <laughs> and marry great wealth. But you, you were saying that with you, you, someone what? No, sorry, you go. Well I just marry someone who just thought I was fabulous and didn't speak very much. Or when they spoke, just said really amazing things and had a very good eye. That would be good. But so that's the know, goal for Gretel now, to, to marry someone that just doesn't say much and just. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, if I really did want that, I guess it would have happened. I don't really want that. I like my life. But I, I do think we need to not applaud me more, but I think, I think it would be great if our society really understood that whenever a comic or a band or or whoever is is creating something they they're a small business they're entrepreneurs they they don't have all the flashy titles the lead singer in the band's not the ceo but but they they've got to do every single thing every time the marketing and if it goes wrong it's blamed on them like if it doesn't matter yeah but but they're, they're the face yeah, but I mean the whole the whole team as well, you know. But that the skill that's required for so many people to be successful in the arts, I think, is really underrated, um, and the commitment. So no, I'm happy in this strange planet of the arts. I think. <laughs> so you never sort of set out then when you started on like um, midday with Ray Martin and presenting on Coast to Coast to sort of become this you know, the, the most talked about lady in Australia, that was never a goal of yours? No, I, I was quite reluctant to have attention. No, there were gigs. I mean, I had my children young and I was a single mum young, pretty yeah. young, I think. Um, and and I made um, money doing voiceovers yeah. and then every other way I could. So... <laughs> 
no way. If I if it had been my plan to be, wouldn't have even occurred to me. But if it had been my plan to be famous, I don't think I would have taken the path I did. <laughs> I would have been focused, yeah. and I would have known what the point of it is. Fame is. I mean, I think it's important to use your voice if you have, if you are recognised. If you do have a voice, I think it's really important to use it to help others where you can. But sometimes um, in what we do, you have to focus all your attention on keeping your own head above water. And then in the times when things are a little bit easier, you I, you focus on others and then your own family might get in some calamitous situation. So back to keeping head above water. But I think that's okay. We In the arts, we tend to do a fair bit for others anyway. We're always being called upon to and, and you do things have, for free. Um, so I guess in- as you're um, at, at the heat, height of your fame and that you did like you do a lot of work, uh, even still for um, children with HIV AIDS, uh, pets without borders, um, you know, the LGBTQIA plus community is it important for you that you've got such a, a strong, powerful platform to use that voice for social justice. Um, I think it's fair to do it yeah. um, because it's a responsibility and also, but it, that, that's a, a response that comes from my mind, from my heart. I think also that, um, that I think nobody's life is more important than anybody else's. And I think if you can help someone else along the way, then that is a great thing and great thing. And, um, but as I said, um, no, I mean, I mentioned angels before, but I'm not one of them. I, I am so? by no means. No, God. I would think uh, anyone that brings happiness and joy and light, and you know, if someone looks forward to seeing something, you know, they're having a shitty week and they know that, oh, I'm going to see this on a Friday night or something. That's an angel. That's someone that's providing hope and joy to someone, and I, I don't think you should discount that. That is very sweet thing to say. Um, that's very nice of you. But there are the other, um six and a half days of the week when you're trying to survive yourself and 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 not necessarily, you know, you might be jealous of someone or you might, um, you know, feel things that you don't necessarily express but feel things that don't make you angelic. You know, there might be things in your heart a bit disgruntled or a bit, pissed off or whatever it is. <laughs> I, I don't imagine angels running around going, oh, God, Lindy I... got a promotion. <laughs> Everything's flawed, though. Like everything, like even the most beautiful things in the world are flawed, and I think that's what makes things, you know, beautiful. So yes, think... it's true, but I certainly think that the, the big teacher in the sky would write on my report, could do better. <laughs> and also talks too much. <laughs> no, I, think, I think you've done very well. I am curious to know, like you would have done hundreds and hundreds of these sort of interviews and you'd get asked the same questions all the time. What's a question that has never been asked of you that you always think in the back of your head, oh, they'll ask about this and they never have, or if not a question you wish someone would ask about Gretel Colleen? Um. Well, that's a little bit hard for me to imagine, I must say. I don't – I think I appreciate it, as you have done, like put thought into this. I really appreciate Um When you write a book, people can tend to write the, ask the same questions, um, sometimes because – they're too busy to have read the book so they, they don't go into it deeply or it might be constrained by time. I – I would very, lo- I would really love every single person I meet to tell me what they think the meaning of life is because <laughs> I'm particularly interested in that. And I always have been, like since I was a weeny little tot, I've always been fascinated by it. And, you know, I can't sum my, my philosophy up in two seconds, so I don't know that others necessarily can. But I just, I'm just fascinated because when I look at people around me and I think, well, what your value system, which is determined by why you think you're here, we're here, everything you do in the day or how you treat other people must be determined by why you think 
we're here. And, uh, yeah. and I'm surprised at the number of people who never seem to think about it. <laughs> Just get up and do things. I'm like, but how? Like you don't even know whether you should recycle if you – don't know if there's anything after this or if this is all there is or, you know, I just. Is, is that an artist thought maybe? Because my, um, I, I think, I think I probably have a similar thought line as you. I'm always thinking about why, why. Uh, and my, my partner <laughs> um, is entirely opposite, not an artist at all. And everything for him is just how, like, you know, problem solving and engineering. Really? Whereas, yeah. Mine's a question of why things are happening. And yeah, I just find that very interesting. And a lot yeah. of artists do think about things with a bit more, uh, maybe not empathy is the word I'm after, but a bit more um, trying to understand other people and whereas a lot of people are just, this is what oh, I Oh, that's very to interesting. Yes, um, it, it could be the how versus the why. Um, but I do also think that just because we ask why doesn't mean we also can't work out how. Yeah. Um, you know, artists are very good problem solvers. Um, so... I, th I think I, there was a bloke, I, I, he was a friend of mine, that, and he would talk about the lack of empiri empirical evidence of there being anything after this life. And what a bombastic, silly thing to say. <laughs> There's no empirical evidence that there isn't either. And it was, it, it was all really a perspective that was constructed to justify a very shallow existence. I say without judgment at all. <laughs> I mean, totally, yeah, just on totally the other side judging there, yeah. this person. <laughs> he's not listening. He's not talking to me at the moment. So we're safe. So there we, we go. Can just Good. Keep, yeah. Yeah. Probably because I make comments like that. But that doesn't mean I'm right. It just means as you are um, just curious. Yes. Why is it so? Does that make that hard then as someone who does have questions and sometimes quite strong opinions to go out there and have the platform that you do to put it out there that because of social media and various things, sometimes people are very quick to with their replies. Do you wish that that didn't exist to the extent well, that it does? I don't really, I don't use social media very well. Um, and I certainly don't do it to engage in conversation with a lot of people. Like Twitter, I, I don't, I don't really do like a post every now and then. But I don't want to engage in conversation. Uh, I just don't. I want to get on with what I do. I think my responsibility is uh, to create. It's, yeah. it's to share my perspective on things. I do that on TV or radio and, I, I mean, you say on my platforms, you make me sound much more grand and omnipotent than I really am <laughs> uh, and omnipresent, I must say. I, like I'm totally not. Uh, like this they're already there. They're, they're words that are beyond my vocabulary. There you go. You're already, you're already uh, up there. <laughs> Just stick the word om in front yeah, of anything yeah. <laughs> you want. It makes you sound posh. There's there's a tip for you. Um, I, I, what do I do? I, I think I'm still growing up. No, I just, I don't think I've anywhere near arrived um, at where I'm, where I'm going. I think that that's fine. That is where it should be. For people my age, that's kind of odd because in five or seven years or what, 10 years, that's when people, my peers will be retiring. Some of them already have, whereas I'm thinking, oh, I'm just getting going. But I don't really, I'm not sure that I know enough about everything to be putting my ideas out there. Having said that, I do do, I do <laughs> put my ideas out there. But, but not on social media, really. I just, I rarely engage with Facebook. I don't really engage with it. I, I don't know yeah. why. Instagram, I like pictures, put those up sometimes. Pictures but, are nice opinions. But then I think, who cares? <laughs> who cares about what, what I'm – like I want I want to share my art and shows that are coming up, but, but then I think I don't want to interrupt other people's lives with the rest of the hoo-ha that's going on. Oh, yay, we're all together having fun. I think, yep. who's going to be happy about that? Nobody. <laughs> I don't want to make people sad. Yeah, jealous they're sitting at home in the pyjamas or what have you. <laughs> I'll be jealous of myself. <laughs>
<laughs> now, I do want to know, you were um, using uh, a beautiful, you've got a beautiful vocabulary and you were talking about yourself um, saying that you don't think you're, you're ab- above and, and up there, even though a lot of people do. Uh, and then you were saying you also have a, you're still growing up. Is that why uh, a lot of your books, bums are a big thing? Maybe I have given you too much credit. There seems to be so much about bums in your books. The day my bottom fell out or... Uh, no, uh, there isn't really. Or my grandma's face well, looks like a bum. Well, it depends on the age group. <laughs> in, in the, uh, no, there's, invisible it depends lady. on the age group. Yeah. <laughs> um, when my children were little, I wrote... Uh, quite a few children's books. One for young adults was called My Life is a Wedgie. That was part of a series. <laughs> and one I wrote as an adult was The Night My Bum Dropped, which was just uh, in relation to a thing that happens as you get older yeah. where you can just feel your bum drop. Um, <laughs> And it was and it was related to a joke, but no, I haven't actually written that much about bums, I must say. But there's you know, as I said, I haven't reached my peak. I may be pursuing that new angle. But the new book, um, which I really like, is is about mother daughter love. And it's a comedy, but it's also it really I really want to explore the notion of mother-daughter love and I do it through three generations and the daughter, so Nora's the one in the middle, she's my age-ish, her daughter, she has two daughters and one of them disappeared for four years, didn't speak to her mother. She spoke to her sister but didn't speak to her mother and the mother, Nora, never knew what happened. Oh, and wow. suddenly that daughter rings and, yeah, she says, I'm getting married uh, and I want you to help. And the mother has spent four years uh, whipping herself and blaming herself and with mother guilt, what did I do wrong? And and so this wedding is an opportunity to make everything better. Of course, that is not what happens. But at the <laughs> same time, her own mother, um, who, as many people my age, um, have is a mum with increasing dementia and and that so that's kind of the sandwich that Nora is there with her daughter getting married and her own mother um, with increasing dementia so so aware that this clock is ticking Mm -hmm. and there's only so much time to resolve mother-daughter relationships and she realizes everything her daughter is blaming her for is really similar to much that she's blamed her own mother for for her throughout her whole life. So it's about healing and forgiving and the fact that we never actually arrive in that perfect place where, ah, now we're here. Now we can all relax forever because we've worked life out. Because as soon as you start to think that, it's neat, 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 and in comes some so, crazy thing you never anticipated. Yeah, it just throws the whole thing up in the air. So... And just to finish uh, my answer to your question, I don't think there's much discussion about bums in that book. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> I just love the line about That's okay. uh, grandma's face looking like a bum. I just thought that was <laughs> wonderful. And I found myself <laughs> looking in the mirror afterwards going, does my face look like a bum? And is it going to look like one when I'm older? <laughs> is it, did- Everyone's face can look like a bottom. It does. <laughs> Some people speak yeah. like their faces are bottom. A lot of crap comes out sometimes. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Oh, I'll be keeping my eye out for that now. <laughs> With um, you, you did start off writing uh, quite a lot of children's literature. Did you fall in love as a child from uh, a particular author, uh, someone, or did you have someone that read books to you that is the reason you love books and writing so much? Um, thank you for that question, but no, I did not. I had a lonely chat. No, I didn't. I just, I, I'll be uh, edit that out. No, oh I love and kidding. I am. Um, Great. <laughs> I am. Um, I loved um, escaping with reading when I was little. Um, I just loved it, and then I read all the books that you're meant to read at school. But there was a big empty space there for a while. I think reading is an amazing thing to do for your own brain yeah. and for your imagination and and for comfort to escape 
this world is fantastic, but the way that we have structured this world, not necessarily us, but we all help to perpetuate it, um, can be a bit vacuous and competitive and unbeautiful. And, and I think it's really good to be reminded, weirdly through escapism rather than being more present, which would be a good way to do it too, <laughs> that, that, yeah, that this experience of life is, is extraordinary and we should seize it. And sometimes, bizarrely, we have to read about other people doing it instead of actually looking at our own lives and like, wait a minute, I have the chance to lead an extraordinary life too. So there were no, I wasn't read to, I read to myself and I liked escaping. And I don't know if that helped my imagination, of course, because I don't have a before and after, you know, a with or without. But I do think anything that encourages your imagination is brilliant because an imagination doesn't just allow you to escape. It allows you to solve problems, yep. um, to assess circumstances and find ways out or ways in. Uh, you can apply an imagination to how you're going to structure your finances. No, it's a really <laughs> important tool that, you know, that, that a lot of us simply have have not um, fed when when you're writing, do you are you able to escape when you're writing? Like you like as a reader, you were talking about you can escape and enjoy these worlds. Are you able to enjoy that as an author and creator as much as a reader would, or you find yourself getting bogged down in the the intellect of it? No, I, I well because of the hours I write, which is early in the morning. I have since heard that a lot of writers prefer to write then. For me, I write early in the morning because that's this magical time where I feel like... Possibilities are ahead. Well, like I'm writing the book not knowing what is going to happen just as much as anyone reading that. I I will get surprised. A character will will enter or something I've, I've just been writing and all of a sudden their car broke down and... That doesn't sound at all interesting. But then (laughs) it was the way it broke down and who came to rescue them, and that wasn't meant to be happening at all. So for me writing that, it's exciting to think, I wonder what's going to happen next. Although in that particular novel, the one that I'm writing now, um, it's halfway through. So I've got a little bit of a plan as to where the story is going. But very much for me it's, it's tuning in and then I write down the character the characters come into my head and they say, write this, Gretel, write this dialogue, and or they just start talking. I don't know where they come from. But have you seen someone about um, that? Very <laughs> <laughs> it's a very invigorating way to work. If I'm writing a journalistic piece that's totally in my head, it's yes. all about control and refinement and and a limited number of words and, and you no, know, it's really like get in, get out, get what are, what are we about here? Um so I prefer writing fiction because it's it is exciting, not knowing not knowing where you're gonna go. That's fun. And um, my daughter's wedding, uh, you were saying the character's similar to your age and you've got a, a mother and you know you've also got a daughter. Was it hard to separate the fiction from some reality moments or bits of it creep in? Will we discover a bit more of Greta Colleen uh, by reading it or it's it's all fiction? Well, one friend said to me, oh, wow, Nora is totally you. And another friend <laughs> said to me, well, one thing's for sure, Nora is not like you at all. So I, I don't, I don't uh, base my characters on people um, because – it's it's not worth the social ramifications. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's and as I said, I have an imagination, so I don't need to do to that. Go there. Yeah. If I was solidly basing, well, most characters that we write are much more complex and layered than many of the people that would be in our lives because. Yeah. Our friends and acquaintances don't share that depth with us, their depth of history, their fears, their complications, their secrets, their sins. You know, some some of our friends do. Some never shut up about it, and that's <laughs> fabulous. But, but 
really we we tend not to know uh, that many people that well, but but a character in a book you can know inside out. So so there are many reasons why I don't base the characters. Uh, on people in particular, and also my daughter is fabulous. So th- this mean daughter, it's really, it, it it was really a device that came to me to help explore um, the concept of mother daughter love, and also the, the the thing that that I got from my own mum with the muddle headedness that increases with so many of us. Um, it was an opening into that and that of course led to as I said the the ticking bomb of how because in a book any or in a film whatever that device of time limit would like Cinderella oh midnight oh what's gonna happen (laughs) that's what this book is about you know we know we know there isn't long so um I took One of the things that's been really interesting about My Daughter's Wedding is that people from other cultures have read it and enjoyed it, which and and totally related to the mother-daughter relationship because I didn't know if it was just a kind of Western thing going on here um, or or how rivalrous and and, uh, complicated it is in other cultures as well. So... (laughs) <laughs> Turns out it is complicated in a lot of cultures. I think so. Oh, that sound we just heard yes. then, Gretel, uh, means it's time to play Ben Murphy's uh, the Rapid Fire Questions. So I'm going to put a minute on the clock and I'm going to ask as many questions as I can. So it can be a really short answer. What if I – can I get them – is it possible to get them wrong? And is there uh, a prize? <laughs> it is, Gretel Colleen. Are you ready? Your yes. time starts now. Red carpet hair looks, the loose sort of dreadlocks, cool look at the arias, or uh, singing freely as yourself dressed as an octopus? Uh, the cool, loose dreadlock look. <laughs> being out loud and proud with your views and thoughts, but receiving criticism, or keeping it to yourself, thus being left alone? <laughs> Option A, please, out loud and proud. <laughs> Do you still stand by your past comment, you are a non-practicing heterosexual? It, I'm... I'm... <laughs> Mm, I dip my toe in and out of that scenario, but for the sake of an answer, yes. Your life now or or in the early 2000s? Oh, definitely now. Are you glad social media wasn't really a thing when you were a host now? Oh, I think you're forgetting we had MSN. Oh, what is the most contentment and proud you've ever been with one of your professional achievements? Well, the most contented you're ever going to be is when it's not put out into the marketplace to be assessed. <laughs> like if you're just totally happy with your own. Um, painting in. is really fulfilling. I really enjoy that. But uh, but I also find it enjoyable even just to have a quick-witted comment at a dinner party or in a taxi. So I don't have one at the very top. They can come anywhere at any time and often uh, they disappear when you really, really need them. Oh, well, time is out. Gretel Colleen's fabulous new book, My Daughter's Wedding, is out now at all good retailers and online. Gretel Colleen, it's been an absolute pleasure and a joy. Thank you so much for your time. Ben, you are an excellent interviewer and chat host. Thank you very much.